but Acts chapter number 2, verse number 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, chapter number two, the book of Acts, the day of Pentecost. Peter, I don't, don't necessarily know, Brother Ron, if I'm in the business of ranking the greatest messages of all time, but I've never preached one where 3,000 people got saved. I mean, it is a powerful message. In fact, he's so much under the Holy Ghost, they thought he was drunk. And he said, oh, no, no, I got something better than that, and then just went into preaching. But by the time we get to the end of chapter number two we know that on the day of Pentecost 3,000 were saved those that were added to the church it says that they continued daily one another in the temple they went to church every day and then it says that they continued in each other's houses breaking the bread and that they were in one accord right very rare thing that an entire church is in one accord in fact I don't know that other than this example that there's any one recorded instance where everybody was in one accord as a called out body of believers they were trying to get to there for 120 days before the Holy Ghost came but great work that God did on the day of Pentecost great work that he continued to do in the days afterward how many were saved each day as many that would be saved but God added to the church daily it said but taking that as our text and where we're at I want to go back we're not going to read it but I'm going to hit the highlights for you out of chapter number one to show you that this church wasn't in the perfect will of God but yet God still did a great work where were they they were in the permissible will of God they weren't in the perfect will of God and then based off of that what we're going to teach on today are the dangers of being in the permissible will of God now, if we go back to chapter number one, we know first we get the account of the Lord giving the great commission. He's taken back up into heaven. Then the 120, that's where we get the number of 120 souls that were with them. We find that in chapter number one. We're in the upper room gathered together. That names all the apostles. And then it says that they were praying. They were waiting on the Holy Ghost to come. Then... Verse number 15 of chapter number 1, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of the names together were about 120. Men and brethren, the scriptures must needs have been fulfilled. And then he goes to talk about how Judas betraying the Lord, that his bishopship should be taken away. Because there was one of them that was of them. And then he goes and talks about how David prophesied that that would be the case. Then he goes on to talk about that uh, the field of blood that he had purchased with the 30 pieces of silver and how according to God's prophecy that no man would ever live there because it was a cursed ground but then they go on to say you know what we know that there needs to be 12 so let's pick a 12 and they laid out some great qualifications they said first they got to be there from when Jesus was baptized with John the Baptist all the way up until when Jesus was taken back up into you know glory but specifically on the night that he was taken into custody is that he's got to be with us from then got to be witness to everything and they actually found two of them both of them they said good men I mean consider it we like to think when we read the Bible that there's only 12 people with Jesus and those were the disciples no there's a great many people that went with him everywhere fact we know that at least there were 14 people that were with him from the time that he got baptized all the way up until when he was taken custody because that's what Peter said the qualifications of these two men were 
Now that's not counting women. Don't tell me how many of them there were. But, just side note, don't know where this came from, but just because you meet the qualifications doesn't mean that God's giving you the calling to do it. That doesn't matter if it's a pastor, doesn't matter if it's a deacon, doesn't matter if it's a Sunday school. You can have all the qualifications in the world, but unless God puts his hand on you, it ain't going to amount to anything. But anyway, you find that they cast lots. That's always a real biblical thing to do. And Brother J.D., let's just gamble on who it needs to be. We'll just leave this to chance. Now, don't look down on them. Holy Ghost hadn't come yet. But was the duties of the Holy Ghost? Well, he was supposed to lead and guide us into all truth. Right now, there's a whole other lesson on when you think that you can see, but you don't have a guide. Okay, they thought that they were doing the right thing, but they didn't wait on God to come up and show them how to do it. But we find a man of the name Matthias. I'm going to call him Matt. Matt, Matt, good guy. Matt saved on his way to heaven. Matt had been with the Lord. He was faithful. There's just one problem. Matt wasn't the Apostle Paul because that's the one that God picked. Granted, Paul hadn't even been saved yet. But yet God knew who the apostle to the Gentiles was going to be. They got the cart in front of the horse. So on the day of Pentecost, they had an apostle that God didn't want. But yet God still saved 3,000 people. It says that they were all in one accord. That means that everybody gathered agreed that Matt was the new apostle. Which means everybody wasn't in the will of God. But yet God still showed up and saved 3,000 people. And then afterwards, was adding to the church daily. It was Peter's idea to name this new apostle, but yet God used him to preach the message on the day of Pentecost. What he said, they weren't in the perfect will of God, Brother Ron, but they were in the permissible will of God. God winked at their ignorance and the fact that, yep, yeah, you can pick whoever you want, but I got one lined up. We've heard it mentioned a lot around here. Jesus said that John Baptist was the greatest man ever born a woman. But outside of him, the Apostle Paul's a pretty good candidate. He only wrote nearly half of your New Testament. Some of the verses that give us such encouragement, some of the promises that are given to us from the Word of God were written by his hand as he was the instrument of the Holy Ghost. He was used greatly. In fact, his mission trips, he went to every part of the known world at that time. But it's not the one that the apostles would have picked. Who'd they pick? They picked Matthias. Who'd they pick? They picked somebody that they knew, somebody that they were comfortable with, somebody that they were familiar with, something that made sense to them. But God uses the base things that confound the wise. His ways are above our... His ways are done in a way that only God could have done it. But how do you know that God couldn't have made Matthias an apostle? Because the apostles made him an apostle. God took one that used to be an enemy, but yet made him a crusader for God. So he's saying, Brother George, day of Pentecost, unbeknownst to them, they weren't in the will of God. But yet God still showed up and did something mighty. In fact, Peter got up and preached, probably in Greek, because that was the common language at the time. But even if he'd have preached in Hebrew, it didn't matter, because everybody in attendance heard in their native language. That's the miracle of speaking in tongues, that I can speak hillbilly and you hear it however it is that you need to hear it. Right? But J.D. can preach whatever Brother J.D. talks. There ain't nobody talk like him. But yet, if you'd have dropped him in the middle of Africa, everybody would have understood it in their own language. That was the speaking of tongues. Right? But, even after this, I mean, I hope that just and briefly shows you that they weren't in the will of God. Perfectly. They was in the will of God. They was all gathered together. They was in one accord. They were continuing daily, right, and learning from the apostles. Then they continued in the doctrine of the apostles. But because the church was in the permissible will of God and they weren't striving to be in the perfect will of God, it caused some problems. And that's the danger of being in the permissible will of God. God's able to wink at our ignorance. God's able to show His grace and mercy. If you're in the permissible will of God, God can do, still do great things, but it's in spite of us. Even if you're in the perfect will of God, God does for us what you can't do for yourself. 
It's only by the grace of God that you're able to stay in the perfect will of God. But yet the church was in the... God's doing great things and they became complacent. They never strove to be in the perfect will of God. They got comfortable with God doing great things and just believing that God would always do great things. But see, God had given them some commandments. God had given them some instructions. And the apostles, first and foremost, weren't above rebuke. Let me give you an example. You can go back and read what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Okay? Go back and read it. And you're going to find that he preaches about how the gospel is open to all. Both those that are near and those that are far off. Right? Because it hadn't been written yet. But whosoever can become a part of the family of God. Right? Anybody. That's what he's preaching on the day of Pentecost. And he's preaching it to people that don't speak the, you know, the language of the day. What's that tell me? There's probably some in there that weren't Jews. Right? He's preaching to Gentiles on the day of Pentecost, but yet, later on down the line, you find that Peter gets a little bit of Pharisee in him. In fact, the Apostle Paul had to come back and rebuke him to the face, as he later writes. And God, at one point, had to rebuke him himself. There were two issues, both of them having to do with Gentiles. First one, we'll start where God rebuked him. God told him to go down to witness to a fellow. And Peter said, not so, Lord, that guy's a Gentile. If he goes down there, I'm going to have to eat stuff that's not clean. If I go down there, it's going to make me not right with you. Can you imagine arguing with God, telling God that what God asked you to do was outside of the will of God? But yet, it's what Peter's trying to do. It's still young Peter. This isn't wise Peter by the time we get to 1st and 2nd Peter. This isn't Peter after God had knocked all the sharp edges off. This is still hot-headed Peter. Peter says, Lord, I can't go down there. I'll be unclean. God has smack him upside the back of the head and say, if I told you to go down there, it's not going to make you unclean. God had to send him the vision of the fleece coming down with all manner of food. What Peter learned, as long as you give God thanks for whatever it is that's put in front of you, it's not going to defile you. Right? The Bible says it this way. It's not what goes into a man that defiles him. It's what's already inside of a man that will defile the outside. Right, but Peter's still hanging on to some of them old time ways. More so than that, he's telling Gentiles, well, I don't think he came up with the idea. I think he just said that, hey, that sounds like, that's, that makes sense. That's the problem. When you do things that make sense, they're usually against the will of God. Because God's ways don't make sense to the carnal man. Because the carnal man cannot know the ways of God. They're foreign to him. In fact, your flesh is at enmity with God. It's the enemy of God. God understands your flesh because Christ was robed in flesh and conquered the flesh as your example that through Him you can conquer not only everything in this flesh but everything in the world because greater is He that's in you than He that's in the world. But Peter at some point hears and he wasn't the only one. There's a bunch of them. But they got in their head, well, if you're a Gentile and you get saved, you've got to be circumcised. Well, see, when, Jeter, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, he said that if you believe and then are baptized. On the day of Pentecost, what was salvation? Believe. And then what was baptism? To add them into the church. Otherwise, the last verse of the, you know, the verse in chapter number 2 says 3,000 were added that day. That wouldn't have been true. Because you've got to be added into the church. Baptism's the membership fee. Don't cost you anything, but you have to publicly proclaim that you died out to sin and that you were raised in newness of life with Christ. That's your membership fee to become a part of the church. But that's all that it took on the day of Pentecost, but yet, some months, some days, some years later, then all of a sudden, well, if you're a Gentile, you've got to be saved, then you've got to be baptized to be added. But really, you're not right with God unless you become circumcised. Because that was a custom of the Jews, not the Gentiles, not the heathen. Except, see, there's a problem with that. 
later on you go and read the epistles of the apostle Paul he says he came and he rebuked Peter to the faith because if your faith is in circumcision or in other words works you make everything that Christ did of none effect because you can't earn the favor of God you can't work to be accepted by God your salvation was given because you could not be what God expected as much as you tried even after you get saved as much as you work to be what God wants you to be unless you're doing it by faith it's of none effect because if you do the work where do you want the credit to go to you but yet I find that everything about salvation is that Christ gets the credit for everything done now you say brother Jordan while all this is happening was there you know did God stamp Ichabod above the church no people still getting saved in droves they weren't in the perfect will of God but they's in the permissible will of God God straightened it all out in the end as he will do because God bought the church which means it's his paid for it with the, own, the, the blood of his own son and if he's the head of the church which the Bible teaches us where does the body the head's what tells us what to do the head's going to get control of everything else sometimes he draws them in with that shepherd's hook draws them back close to his side other times he's got to whack you upside the back of the head with that staff and chasing you but eventually he reigns them in because God does chasing his own because God's children he won't allow them to act like heathens God's children he won't allow them to stay in the permissible will of God he'll eventually tell them you got to get to the perfect will of God or you got to go God's only satisfied with one thing smack dab in the middle of the perfect will of God because that's where he desires you to be because that's the only place that you can truly receive be a partaker of and enjoy the fullness of your salvation God didn't save you for you to get a half measure or to get half of what God intended for you. God wanted you to get the whole shebang. Right? He wants to give you press down, shaking, and bubbling over. But if he goes to pour out your blessings and you're not exactly where you need to be to receive them, you're robbing yourself of the blessings of God. God says, no, get here into the middle. Get over here to where you can get the most. To where you're going to be able to receive everything that I'm pouring out for you. Now, the whole different story that if you come with a bucket that's already full God can't pour anything into it but if you're in the perfect will of God you're going out and you're emptying your bucket to those that need it and you're coming back with an empty bucket but even after that you find also don't know where this came from he just reminded me of this who did the Lord send to go witness to the Ethiopian eunuch it's Philip well, study your Bible. Peter was, for all intents and purposes, the first apostle at this time. He was the one that everybody else was following. It's what God ordained him to do. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. He says, Peter, you're going to be the one that's going to be feeding everybody else. Everybody's going to follow you. But keep in mind, thou art Petros, little rock, but upon this rock, referring to himself. He's saying, Peter, you're going to be important, but you're not all that important. He's saying, Peter, you messed up. You denied me three times before the rooster crowed. Right? Just hours after saying, Lord, I'll go to the cross with you. I'll die with you. Right? He's beating himself. We taught on that last week. He's out there beating himself up on the fishing boat. Right? But yet the Lord gets to land and he says, Peter, I've already forgiven you. Forgive yourself and go on and do what it is that I want you to do right? Peter still he's getting a hold on to, every day is something new they didn't have no forerunners right? they were the ones that were blazing the trail but yet Philip not the chief apostle just Philip goes down there and witnesses to the Ethiopian eunuch why didn't God tell Peter to go down there and preach to him maybe Peter wouldn't have gone and preached to him because the Ethiopian was an Ethiopian he's a Gentile Peter didn't want to go eat at a Gentile's house Peter didn't want to go witness to a Gentile's house why because he thought that it would make him less 
to go do so. Well, he's saying, sounds a whole lot to me like a Pharisee. Is that right? No. God straightened it out in the end. In fact, go read First and Second Peter. Who does he write the books to? Those that are scattered abroad. Those that he had never in the flesh met, but those that God had saved. Sounds a whole lot like Gentiles to me. What happened? God did a work in his heart. Eventually, Peter got right with God. He was in the permissible will of God, but eventually he got to the point where he was in the perfect will of God. But see, it caused some problems. Then later on, granted it says that at one point that is all in one mind and one accord. That didn't last long either. Because you got some that are saying, well, you got to be circumcised, and others saying, that don't sound like what Jesus said. Then you got a whole bunch of other crowds saying, well, who's right and who's wrong, and they're arguing amongst themselves. But yet, God still adds to the church. Church still grows. Church gets to the point that depending on who you read and who you ask, there's going to be a whole bunch of different estimates on how big the church was. Church is big. How big is the church? Bigger than this church. A whole lot bigger than this church. So big that 12 apostles couldn't minister to everything that needed to be done for the church, so they had to start appointing deacons. And that's only in chapter 4 of the book of Acts. Right now, we got a preacher. God gave us a bishop, as the Bible would call him. Right? He, he gave us a pastor, and pastors got deacons. Pastor has an assistant pastor, because there's a lot going on around here. But if you had 12 preachers and deacons on top of it, and they were still having trouble taking care of all just the day-to-day the -day of the church as a big church. It's a big job keeping all of them in one mind and in one accord. That's because it wasn't their job. That was the Holy Ghost job. But church gets big, keeps getting bigger, and the people of the church, because of the mindset of being complacent and in the permissible will of God, they started to forget a few things. Well, what they forget? Well, they kind of forgot what Jesus told them right before he went to heaven. Because he said, after that which the Holy Ghost has come upon you, meaning after the day of Pentecost, they didn't know when it was coming at that point. But they said, after the Holy Ghost comes upon you, which is in chapter number 2, ye, talking to those in attendance and anybody that was listening, it applied to everybody. Ye still applies to you today. Ye shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem. That's where they were. Judea, that's around where they were. Samaria, which included the Gentiles, and the uttermost parts of the world. Ye, talking to that group. Who's that? That's at least 120 that were up in the upper room. They at least heard him say that. But where were they? They still in Jerusalem. God permitted it for a time. They were in the permissible will of God, but eventually God said, y'all being disobedient. You've gotten outside the permissible will of God, and now you're just out of the will of God. Because in the will of God, there's only two things. Either God, you're in the permissible will of God, which means, like all of us, God's working on us to get us closer to the perfect will of God. And then there's the smack dead perfect will of God. You know where you were the day that you got saved? You was in the permissible will of God. Because God permitted it that you had heard the gospel. You know when you got into the perfect will of God? When you gave up fighting and you know, resisting conviction and you got to the altar. The moment that you got saved, you was in the perfect will of God. That's proof enough that you can get there. But you can also stay there. You don't have to live in the permissible will of God. You're robbing yourself and you're preventing God from doing everything that he desires to do. Well, the church, it was permitted for a time that they would grow, that the church at Jerusalem would increase. You can't go out and teach something that you haven't learned. It says that they continued daily in the apostles', or the apostles doctrine. They were being discipled. They were learning. Well, there was a point that they outgrew the nest and they should have gone. Where? 
to Judea, to Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. They should have gone, but they didn't. They got comfortable. They knew the day to day when they were in Jerusalem. They went to the temple every day and then they met in each other's houses. They broke bread. They fellowshiped. They increased. They were witnessing. They telling anybody that asked them. But God said, there's too many of y'all here. Was it too many because God couldn't support that many in the church? No, it was too many because God wanted them somewhere else. Consider Jonah. You know where it was? The perfect will of God for Jonah to be? Nineveh. When God came and talked to him, said, hey, Jonah, get down there in Nineveh, preach. Tell him God's judgment's coming if they don't repent. He said, okay. He went in the opposite direction. Everywhere from where Jonah started until he got to the fish was the permissible will of God. God gave him an opportunity to repent, turn around, and go to Nineveh. Until that whale swallowed him, Jonah could have said, you know what, boys? I got to turn the boat around. I got to go the other way. What happened? He got to a point where he was out of the permissible will of God. And then he had, he was in the perfect will of God. He's in the belly of a fish. For how long? Three days and three nights. How bad was it? He thought he was in hell. Then he gets puked up on the beach. He doesn't know where he's at, but God knows exactly where he's at. He's in the perfect will of God. What happened? Jonah had to lose control of his life to get back into the perfect will of God. But what happened to the early church? God, not desiring to, he never intended it to be this way, but God had to send persecution. Because they wouldn't leave on their own, so he had to drive them out. There's a herd of sheep, and he set a couple of dogs loose to scatter them. Where did they go? Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. You know where they ended up? Exactly where they should have been all along. Why did persecution have to come? Because they got comfortable in the permissible will of God. Were they in the will of God? Yep. But they weren't all the way in. What happened as a result? Persecution. Persecution. Why did persecution come? Because of their resistance to the pull of the Holy Ghost to go elsewhere. We already read it in our text. It says in verse number 43, Fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Sounds to me like they're taking up all them stakes and all them anchors that they had to their life. They sold everything. Nothing left to bind them to Jerusalem other than the fact that that's where they wanted to be. When you got saved, God tell you to sell everything that you had and give it to the church? No. Why? Because it wasn't the will of God. Why did they do it? Because God knew they weren't going to need it. They was going to be headed out soon. God knew, hey, give it to the church. church is going to take care of you when you're out there in Samaria, in Judea, and the uttermost parts of the world. Go read what the Apostle Paul said, that when he had need, God either provided it or he used one of the churches to supply it. God intended to take care of their every need with what he had already given them. Because what did they sell? What God gave them. Why did God give it to them? Because he knew that they needed to sell it so that they could go out and they could go to other places. But yet, they stayed. Sounds to me like at the beginning they were all in for what God wanted, but something changed. They got further into the permissible will of God until eventually they was out of the will of God. The will of God is progressive. Where God wants you today is not where God wants you tomorrow. He expects you to grow. Sometimes He expects you to go like in this situation but whatever it is God is not satisfied tomorrow with where you were today God is not satisfied with you today where you were yesterday if you get complacent you get comfortable in the permissible will of God God's will keeps progressing and if you stay where you're at eventually you're going to fall out of the will of God 
Because you can't stay where you are. When the if you get if you driving down the road, you pull off to a rest stop, and everybody else loads back up in the car, and you stayed at the rest stop, you're gonna be out of contact with them real soon. Back back in the days before cell phones, you may have had a CB radio or a walkie-talkie, but there's coming a point where they aren't they're not gonna get the signal no more. What happens? You're out of range. Well, if you stay where you're at, you're going to get out of range of the will of God. And when you get there, it's either, well, you're certainly going to have to reap what you've sown. But in addition to that, that's when the Lord chastens you. Every day you're in the permissible will of God is God giving you a space of grace to repent and get back to the perfect will of God. To lose whatever weight that does so easily beset us so that you can get back to where God is. You know where God's at? In the perfect will of God. He's also everywhere because of the Holy Ghost. Everywhere at all times and all places. Until He raptures the church out, the Holy Ghost is everywhere that you go. And even after He raptures the church out, if you're saved, the Holy Ghost is everywhere you go because He's going to be in heaven too. But, getting complacent, getting comfortable in the per missable will of God eventually will lead to being out of the will of God. you got to get out of your comfort zone in order to stay in the perfect will of God. Because the will of God is going to take you places that are hard, that don't make sense to you, where you may not want to be on display, but He's going to put you on full display for those around you. Why? So that He can prove what He's put into you. Not prove it to you. You know what He put in you because you feel it. The moment you got saved, you felt the Holy Ghost. You're going to feel it until you either go through the ground or you go through the sky, one or the other. It's in you. Well, He's got to prove to others out there that it is what it is, that it's true. I've used the example before. You know the only way to tell gold from pyrite or fool's gold? Gold's able to be crushed. It's able to be bent. It's able to be twisted. Fool's gold, when you bend it, it'll break. But real gold, you've got to be able to push at it, but it doesn't change what it is. You can shape it. You can twist it. You can do whatever you want to with gold. You know what it still is? It's gold. Don't change the value of it. You know the only way to tell that a diamond is a diamond? Because it'll cut everything else, including other diamonds. Every now and then God puts you out there as a diamond and says, take your best shot. It's not going to be enjoyable. They may grind you up against things. They may try to crush you with all the weight of the world, but a diamond stays a diamond. Nothing stronger. Even when you put it up against another diamond, you split it in half, guess what it still is? A diamond. But we know this is a diamond. Let's put it up against that. It's coming out a diamond on the other side. Well, you say, well, if you split a diamond, it's not as valuable. Hogwash. God is the mender of broken things. If it's the will of God for you to become broken, He's going to put you back together. If only to show the world that He can do things that they thought impossible. Where's all that happen? In the perfect will of God. I'm sure they knew that leaving their home, Jerusalem, the place that they were born and raised, the place where they had learned everything. It's hard. When God tells you, well, for a little while, you're going to have to go away from the place that you come in and it's your refuge. It's your safe space. This is where you come to get help. All they had ever known was the glorious, you know, fellowship of being in one accord with the brethren. That they could set aside everything else and say, I know where I'm accepted. And he's saying, you got to go to the place that you're not accepted. Why do you think he sent them in pairs most of the time? So that they'd have a person that they could fellowship with. Because he knew where they were going. There wasn't going to be no fellowship. There's going to be despised and rejected. And there's going to be rebuked of men. They said, man, that sounds hard. It was hard. In fact, many of your Christian brethren, because of the persecution that came, they were torn asunder. 
put into the Colosseum. Let wild animals put out unto them. Many of them crucified. But yet, most of them were so insistent that they weren't worthy to be crucified in the same manner as Jesus. Some were crucified upside down or crucified sideways. Because they said, we don't deserve to be a symbol like he was. Only his cross should have been up and down. Crucify me a different way. Even Philip wasn't crucified. He's stoned to death. But where was he in the perfect will of God? How do you know that? Because he looked up and Jesus standing ready to receive him in the glory. I believe he didn't feel a thing. But all that being the dangers of being in the permissible will of God. You know what revival is really good at? Getting people back to the permissible will of God. They repent of things and they get, Lord, I'm sorry, and they get back home. And then, after revival, God's will keeps progressing. But they want to stay where they got during revival. They want to stay where the great meeting was. They want to stay with the great preaching that they heard. They want to stay with the sweet spirit that they experienced all throughout revival. And they want to stay there and God's will keeps moving and it's not too long you find yourself outside the will of God again. The revival is to remind us that the sweetest place we can be is the perfect will of God. And you may have been there when you came to an altar and when you released some things, when you repented of some things, when you asked the Lord to do what He had done before and restore you. But if you're not careful, long, you know, about five seconds after you get up off of an altar, wherever it was where you did business with God, God's will is already nudging you in this direction and you're resistant to it. Why? Because I'm right where God wanted me to be then. But where does God want you now? You know where God wanted the early church? Abroad. You know where they were? Where God found them. They were content being at the place where they knew God came and got them, but they weren't content being the place where God wanted to send them. If you stayed at the place where God saved you, you wouldn't get very far as a Christian. You'd still be saved on your way to heaven. But if you didn't continue to grow, if you didn't continue to go, and if you didn't continue to show what was going on inside of you, you aren't becoming the disciple or the ambassador or the witness that God wanted you to be. Why did God save you? One, because He loved you. And then after He saved you, He let you stay here. He didn't take you on home to glory because He wanted you to go tell others what He did for you. As a member of a church, He fitly framed you together into the body of Christ. That means he's, there's something here that He wants you to do that only you can do. Because when he fitly framed you in, that means that he made it to where only you to fit in that spot. Nobody else could fit in that spot. Nobody else could do what it is that God wants you to do. But if you don't do it, what are you doing? You're resisting the will of God. If you never find out what it is that God wants you to do, there's no way you can be in the perfect will of God. And just because you do it today doesn't mean that you're going to do it tomorrow. Just because you did it yesterday doesn't give you a pass because today is the Lord's day. Just because you know what it is God wants you to do is completely different than actually doing what God wants you to do. It's easy to know things. It's hard to do things. That's why it's easy being me. It's just my job to know things. I don't have to do nothing. I go to work and they say, what's this? And I tell them, in the job. How do I fix it? Don't know. Not my job. You wanted to know what was broke. I told you what was broke. You didn't ask me how to fix it. They didn't train me on how to fix it. They got guys all over the place. You can pay them a whole lot of money per hour to come out and they'll fix it for you. But my job is to know what's broke and then how to get a new one. Here it is. Go take it to somebody else. It's hard to do it. What's the will of God? It's right here. Well, how do you do it? I don't know. I haven't got around that yet. Knowing the will of God doesn't make you in the will of God. 
Just because you know what God wants you to do doesn't mean that you're in the will of God. You may know that He doesn't want you to do it today, but are you getting prepared to go do it? Because if God's shown you that He wants you to do something, He's going to prepare, He's going to equip you. He's going to make you prepared to do it. Resisting that preparation thing, well, well, we can do that another time. We've got time. You don't know that. Just because God told you what He wants you to do doesn't mean He told you when He wants you to do it. He just said, get ready. By not getting ready. I find that we're supposed to have our wicks trimmed and ready. We're supposed to be ready for the bridegroom to come and knock. You're supposed to be ready for the Lord to tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, it's your turn. Go. For a time, it'll be permissible for you to learn, have a space to prepare yourself, to get ready to go. Because God will never send someone that he hadn't equipped. In other words, he'd tell them to go and do the will of God without being able to fulfill it. That's not the will of God. Sometimes people get ahead of the Lord and they go, go see Naaman an apostle. They knew that it was God's will for there to be a twelfth apostle, but what they do? They could put the cart in front of the horse. They said, we're going to do it now. God said, no we're not. You don't find mention of Matthias ever after chapter number one. What happened? Did you say, well, did God forget about him? No, I'm sure that he's still saved. I'm sure he's in heaven. I'm sure that as soon as he laid life down on this side, to be absent with the bodies, to be present with the Lord. I'm sure he did everything that God wanted him to do. He just didn't do everything that the apostles wanted him to do. Well, you get up and go before God said go, you're going to cause a whole lot of problems. You see, that's the office work of the Holy Ghost is prepare the way. He'll start working on people's hearts. He'll start putting people under conviction long before you show up to say, hey, you want to hear about Jesus? If you show up at the right time, it's a word fitly spoken and the Holy Ghost can take it and do something with it. But if you show up saying whatever it is that you want to say, whenever you want to say it, it may cause more harm than good. Every now and then, maybe in the permissible will of God, God may wink at your ignorance and still use you as an instrument. But there's coming a time that you're going to open your mouth and you're going to find two feet stuck in it. You're going to have to eat crow. You're going to have to go through a few times that Peter learned just because I wanted to didn't mean that God wanted to. Or just because we knew that's what God wanted to do didn't mean that it was God was ready to do it. God already knew where the next apostle was. God already knows where you need to be. The question is, is do you know where that is? And two, are you actively pursuing it? Look at the life of the Apostle Paul. Where'd he go? Literally everywhere in the known world. You know what the Apostle Paul learned? Being in the perfect will of God may look a little bit different every day. Maybe a different place. Maybe different people. You may stay there for a time to plant a church, to raise up some disciples, to train a pastor or a preacher, some deacons. Give them the gospel and the fullness thereof. But eventually you're going to have to go. And you're going to leave part of your heart back with each one of them churches. How do you know? Because he's writing to them all the time. He cared about them just as much as the church that he was in right then and there. Always saying that he desired that he could be there with them in the flesh. But what happened? The apostle Paul said, even though my heart wants to be over there, it's better for me to stay in the perfect will of God. What's the danger of staying in the permissible will of God? The danger is that inevitably the permissible will of God is going to go and you're going to be left exactly where you were. Because God's always moving forward. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God. Why is that? Because the church is always marching forward. But you can choose to stay where you're at and eventually you're going to find yourself out of the permissible will of God. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.